So today's evening devotion is called the Lessons in God's Call, Part Three. Two days we've been having two other devotions. First one was on the call of Abraham, and then was on the life of Jeremiah. And today we are going to focus on the prophet who was unwilling to answer the call. Jonah. You know, if you have read the story of Jonah, or if you have uh, uh, you know been through a Sunday school class when Jonah was taught, and if you have read the Bible book on Jonah, you would find these top ten interesting facts about Jonah. God spoke directly to Jonah and said, "Go to Nineveh and cry against it." Jonah one one. God spoke to him directly. His word was spoken to Jonah. Directly. Next ninth fact that we see about Jonah is, but Jonah headed in the opposite direction. He found a ship leaving for Joppa from Joppa for Tarshish. He paid the fare and boarded it. Says Jonah one three. Man who is called to go in one direction, he goes purposely into an opposite direction. He directly got the word of God, but directly disobeyed the word of God. When the Lord sent a storm, the crew panicked, praying to their gods while Jonah slept. You know, peaceful, like how we guys sleep. You know, this man slept peacefully. He knew the storm was because of him, and he had total peace. They were calling out to their gods, but Jonah was peacefully sleeping. Fact number seven says, when they cast lots to see who was responsible for the calamity, the lot fell on Jonah. So they questioned him. They said. Why is it? Why is God allowing this to happen? Why is it that you are the reason for it? And Jonah told them, "Said I am running away from God." But God still regarded him. Jonah still regarded himself as a man who feared God, <laughs> directly in disobedience to what God has commanded. But still, he considered himself to be a man of God. All right. Now, fact number five about Jonah. Says, God appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. You can find it in Jonah one seventeen. Jesus confirms the story in Matthew chapter twelve verse forty. Just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, says Jesus, the Son of Man will be in the belly of the earth for three days. Okay, so Jesus confirms that the story of Jonah is a true story. Jonah cried out of the depths of depths to God and con- and concluded, "Salvation is from the Lord." Then Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. I have vomited many times in my life, but I have never been vomited myself. You know, so Jonah was in a very sticky situation. He was vomited from the belly of the fish. Interesting. Of course, we missed one. The the crew rode against the growing storm, fearing for their lives. They asked for God's mercy as they finally threw Jonah overboard, and the sea stopped raging. Says Jonah one, verse thirteen to fifteen. Okay, so here is a man because of whom the whole storm was there, and when he was thrown overboard, the storm stopped. Again, God told Jonah to go to the wicked city of Nineveh, and this time he went, preaching that the city would be overthrown in forty days. The people of Nineveh took this message to heart, believed in God, and fasted in repentance. Imagine a whole city fasting in repentance, turning to God. Amazing! Instead of praising God, Jonah was furious. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God who relents concerning calamity. John, Jonah pleaded with God to take his life, but God appointed a plan to give Jonah shade, which made Jonah extremely happy. You would find the references, Jonah four. Was two, three, and six, and the final interesting fact about Jonah. Then God appointed a worm to attack the plant, which made Jonah angry. The Lord said, "You had compassion on the plant, a mere plant. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city of more than one twenty thousand persons?" Okay, so these are the top ten interesting facts from the book of Jonah, just given to you in summary. If you It would be better if you go back and read the whole book. You know, you get more interesting facts of that. But what does the book of Jonah teach us? What can I apply into my life? One of the major things that God, this book teaches us is that God calls us to do a work through His Word. 
when you are faithfully reading his word and studying his word god speaks to us through his word he convicts our heart he gives us a burden from his word god won't give up on you even if you give up on his work even if you give up uh, you know on his word and you run away in disobedience god still won't give up on you god can use bad situations to call people into something great like the storm god can use bad situations to call bad people like us disobedient people like us into obedience and prayer is an essential part of our christian life even prayer from the belly of a fish in life we remember to pray only at the 11th hour mostly you know when things are going way over our heads that's when we remember that prayer is important god can perform a miracle for you god is never short of power god does not re- need a recharge any time anywhere god can perform a miracle for you god does not show favoritism he loved jonah as much as he loved ninevites he does not show favoritism to a certain group of people because of their race their caste uh, their their, ca- their color their language nothing god does not show favoritism and god is merciful to his children god is merciful to those who are perishing we must be glad when people repent and not be grumbling like jonah jonah did not express the love of god in his heart we must be glad when people repent god is in control he is sovereign even when things don't go according to our plan we should understand that god is still in control he is sovereign he does absolutely what he has designed what he has planned nothing can change his control nothing can change his plans and god is more interested in developing your character than giving you your ego boost god is more interested in shaping your character god is more interested in in breaking you down and building you up so that you would have the character of jesus in you so book of jonah teaches us a lot of things very very important truths that we have to apply into our lives no i want to leave you with five misunderstood things about god's call you know some people think that call happens at a definite memorable moment in time need not be you know maybe it it is a series of events that confirm the call maybe you have received the call but you're not still sure of it there is no certain point that needs to be that particular point when god has really called us you know there are many series of events that could be leading for us to completely confirm that this is god's call in my life so please don't misunderstand that it is only a one specific moment in time that god would call you know and next option is that the call is only for those who are specially gifted many people think that it is only for the ones who can sing like mukul and like jibin who can sing and play guitar that you know you they are the ones who are going to receive the call you know it's not it is for all people it is for all all people who are who think who are least gifted gifted even they are invited even they are called i can only take steps into missions once i'm called bible does not say so you know every christian has a call to mission that is a great commission and we don't have to receive a specific call to step into it we are already called for that great commission assigns us this calling to go into all the world and share the gospel make disciples these are all our our tasks and we have to do it it does not start only after i know people are waiting and waiting till the end of their days to think that okay now the call is going to come the call has already come and we just have to obey it god's call is completely irrelevant to becoming a missionary you know people think that it is irrelevant no to be a missionary to step out by faith you know if you look at the antioch church the whole church was not called to go on mission they they were asked to separate paul and barnabas for the mission the whole church recognized it and they supported the ministry but these two men were called to becoming missionaries so god's call is completely relevant to becoming a missionary but all of us are interested with the mission if we can't go 
we must send. Fourth thing, the Great Commission is it only, it only applies to those whom God has called. No, it is apply it applies to the whole congregation. It applies to every individual in the church. We are called to to the Great Commission. You know, you and I have to do this. It is our lay person's responsibility also. It is not specifically people like you know me or uh, Pastor Selwyn are you know those who are to. Uh, 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 you know, comply with the Great Commission. No, all of us have to obey the Great Commission to whatever extent God has made it possible for us. You know, support a missionary. You do it in your own groups. You do it among your own peers. You do it in your own church youth groups. The Great Commission still applies to you. You don't have to go to a foreign land to be a missionary, to be to fulfill the Great Commission. You can be a missionary where God has placed you, even in your office. Right. So the, those were the five things that um, uh, the the numbering is uh, slightly odd, but that was the four five misunderstandings about God's call. The call happens at a definitive, memorable moment in time. No, the call is only for those who are specially gifted. No, I can only take steps into missions once I'm called. No, God's call is completely irrelevant to becoming a missionary. No, to become a missionary, yes, you need the call. The Great Commission only applies to those whom God has called. Yes, that is completely false. Wherever you are placed, in your office, in your school, in your workplace, anywhere, wherever God has placed you, you can be commit completing the Great Commission. I want to introduce to you this lady, Gladys Aylward. She was trained as a servant because she did not have any professional qualification, like an engineer or a doctor. She was rejected by Inland China Mission. Because they said she did not have the qualification to go as a missionary, you know they needed people only like engineers or doctors to go on missions. And this lady had no experience like that. She was only a servant, because she was, uh, you know, raised up in a broken family. All she did was, you know, throughout her life she was helping out in homes as a servant girl, and she she trained herself as a housekeeper. And that was all she she knew. So in that inland China uh, register, she registered her name, and she said, "If there is ever a need for a housekeeper, a homemaker in uh, in China, I'm the person." And then she went back. She waited for a year, and then suddenly a call from China came. The call was, you know, there was a missionary there who had fallen down and broken her leg, and she needed somebody to take care of her home. She she was running a small restaurant where she was evangelizing. She needed somebody to take care of that restaurant, and a servant qualification was needed. And this is what uh, you know, uh, Elrond says. Gladys says about her call. She says, "I wasn't God's first choice for what I have done in China. I don't know who it was. It must have been a man, a well-educated man. I don't know what happened. Perhaps he died. Perhaps he wasn't willing. And God looked down and saw Gladys Elrond, and God said, 'Well, she is willing.'" She is willing. Let me send her, you know. And God sent Gladys like that. She was maybe a replacement for somebody. Maybe she was somebody sent in place of a man who was more qualified than her. She doesn't know. But all she says is she was willing to go. Even a year back, she was willing to go. And here was God sending her to foreign land called China. There she went. She had this lady who had broken her legs. She uh, served her for seven faithful years. She learned the business of Restaurant management, and then that missionary lady died, and there was nobody to take up this particular gap that she had left behind. And Gladys took up that responsibility. She started running the restaurant. She started feeding the poor, and she also, if you can see this book, please get it and read it. It's Gladys Elwood, the little woman. It is her life story. It is full of adventures. How she found out these young orphans throughout China. She would find orphans. Who were abandoned by unmarried mothers? You know their culture is very similar to Indian culture. If you are, uh, you know, an unwed mother, you have you are a disgrace to the family. So the ladies who who get children, they abandon them in the streets, then go back to their own families. So there were many many orphans walking on the streets of China, and this lady who was called the little woman, she went and took care of these orphans throughout her life. She was doing that one after the other. She was helping the orphans. And she conducted so many orphanages throughout China. She was known as the little woman who runs orphanages, little woman of the orphans. These are these are an actual photo. She herself adopted a few of these girls and raised them up as the, her own daughters. You know, she became one among the Chinese. 
the Chinese children called her their mother. Ellis, Gladys Ilward heard God's call. Underqualified, people rejected her, but God knew that she was willing, and God took her all the way to the foreign China, and she lived her life. She struggled a lot with a lot of sicknesses. At last, at the age of sixty-seven, she died, leaving a long legacy of work in the homeland of China. Gladys Aylward. I hope God has been speaking to you over these past few weeks, past few days. I hope you have understood the sessions. I hope you have been attentive in the dev- devotions. I hope the songs have been a blessing to you. And I pray that God would put a burden in your hearts to start praying, start praying for places other than Kerala, places, states other than Kerala, for for regions other than India. Start praying. And see where God would lead you. Start interceding for people groups. You know there are different people groups around us, and pray for different different people groups. We never know whom God is sending, whom God is going to send, and where. But you should be willing and you should be ready. Ask the Lord today, as we fi- wind up this evening's meeting. Ask the Lord, Lord, where do you want to take me? And wherever God wants to take you, that is where you must respond. Hear His call and obey. Shall we pray today? Shall we close before we get the in instructions and uh, you know all the all the result of the quiz? I want you to just close your eyes and look to the Lord, and let's just commit ourselves to obedience. Heavenly Father, we we acknowledge that you have chosen us with a purpose. You have called us to be your hands and your feet, Father. Where you want us to work, we need to be there. Where you want us to take the gospel, we need to go there. We are all underqualified. We have so many excuses. Sometimes we are not the obedient children that we are supposed to be. But still, God calls us. God equips us. God empowers us, and God sends us. Scripture says that we should pray to the Lord of the Harvest, that He should He would send laborers into the vineyard. And Father, this evening we are praying. We are praying to you, Lord Jesus, the Lord of the Harvest. There is a nation out there who does not know Jesus. There are regions and lands out there. There are people groups out there who have not heard the name of Jesus and what He has done for them. Help me to be that voice. Help me to be that person who carries the gospel to the lost. I pray that my heart would be disturbed with a burden to pray for those people. That you would give me a burden, not only to pray, but to go, to do the work that you have called us to do. Help us, O Lord, to be obedient to your word. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen.